you remember the Kennedy assassination? The men on the moon? The peace movement? Woodstock and flower power? The 60s was all about liberating ourselves from a Victorian conservative past, and that very much applied to the music of this decade. Introducing the Fab 60s 12 CD box set, a collection of 12 super CDs that include over 150 of your all-time favorite 60s hits. This set is a must for any collector. And what a wonderful gift this would make. This is a unique collection of the glorious 60s period, featuring the greats of Buddy Holly. Billy J. Kramer. You better tell on me. I'm telling me. Trains and boats and planes were passing by. They mean I trip to Paris or Rome. Listen. Do you want to know a secret? The animals. There it is. A house in New Orleans. They call the rising sun. Oh Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood. Early 60s to newfound greats like Tom Jones, Van Morrison, Marvin Gaye, and Jimi Hendrix. Every track on this unique 12 CD collection is either a top 10 hit or an all time classic from the 60s. The Fab 60s box collection is a truly unique and fantastic collection. Why do you miss when my baby kisses me? Featuring the following tracks Brown Eyed Girl by Van Morrison. Ah, a heart that found better than you. A brown eyed girl. Hey, you, my brown eyed girl. Sweet for my sweet by The Searchers. Sweet for my sweet, sugar for my honey. Your first sweet kiss thrills me. Obla D, Obla Da, the marmalade. Hippie Hippie Shake For goodness sake I got a hippie hippie shake Well I got a shake I got a hippie hippie shake Love is all around I feel it in my fingers I feel it in my toes Well love is all around me And so the feeling grows Over 150 tracks, including artists such as Buddy Holly, Tom Jones, Herman's Hermits, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Jimi Hendrix, Van Morrison, Mamas and Papas, Martha Reeves, Roy Orbison, The Shangri-Las, The Bachelors, The Yardbirds, Percy Sledge, Sam and Dave, Swinging Blue Jeans, Neil Zadarka, Marmalade, the Supremes, and many, many more. This set comes in a fantastic presentation box that includes a unique racking system. You must know several people who would love to own this sensational collector's item. How come you leave me all alone? Watch out for other 12 CD collector's sets. Disco legends, rock and roll legends, 60s and 70s legends, romantic panpipes, peace, relax with the classics, soul legends, the Rat Pack. The 60s saw the birth of artists never seen before. Pop music was never going to be the same again after the 60s. And I
24-hour cameras, wildlife sitcom and drama, emotional cliffhangers, reality TV at its best. The difference? The actors, African wildlife. The set, the African bush. The script writer and producer, Mother Nature. The Karongwe Conservancy, situated at the foothills of the majestic Drakensberg Mountains of Southern Africa, has tasked the research team to monitor the intimate lives of Africa's finest creatures around the clock. Never before have human beings witnessed such riveting characters and intense dramas. Rolani is a leopard whose quest goes way beyond mere survival. He longs for female company, but he has many enemies, not just in the game of love, but in the game of life. Meet brothers Felix and Zero, two powerful and fearsome specimens of lionhood. Master hunters. Felix's roar is worse than his claw, but Zero has zero tolerance. Rare African wild dogs, Alf and Biggles, are locked in a struggle for dominance. Alf has ownership of the pack, but heavy is the head that bears the crown. The delinquent Flippy has rebelled against elephant ways. He's grown up without suitable role models. The boy is insecure and aggressive. Can he turn his life around? High-speed cheetahs, Koba and Shungu, share everything, including their women. They hunt as a unit. But what will happen to this perfect partnership should an accident befall one of them? Teenage Tia has royal blood. This spotted hyena has inherited her mother's dominant status. Watch this princess discover her power and become wise in the ways of the night. Sisters Maggie and Lisa may be powerful predators and great hunters, but even they suffer tragedy and hardship while raising cubs in an unforgiving wilderness. Motherhood is never easy in the Karongwe. Melissa has failed in every attempt to raise a litter as she is too slight to fend for her little ones. Will she ever succeed? Karongwe's researchers are ever present, using their expertise to gather important zoological data. Ivan Killian is a man on a mission. Uh, we've got certain characters that we follow every single day. Uh, we see what they're doing, what their life is all about. These are dedicated conservationists, passionately observing and monitoring behaviors seldom seen by human eyes. And as head researcher Kaylee Owen and her team track Karongwe's wild heroes, they are creating an unprecedented film phenomenon. The Wildlife Diary.
spectacle of nature, that's what Namibia is. It's the location for this week's Railway. With only one and a half million inhabitants, Namibia is characterized by an almost endless fastness. Nature rules here with fierce canyons, rough coasts, endless sand plains, and a wealth of plants and animals. It's been dubbed the diamond of Africa because of the spectacular beauty of the country. A diamond that had long been hidden, but that's now been discovered by a growing number of tourists. We travel with them in a hotel on rails, the Shongololo Express. We meet our fellow passengers in Tsumeb, a small city in the north of the country. They'd begun earlier on the 13-day tour of the Shongololo Express through Namibia. The train is fully equipped as a hotel and sometimes also called the Shongololo Safari Hotel. The Shongololo primarily rides at night so that the travelers can enjoy the short African days to the fullest. It comes equipped with some minivans to take the hotel guests to the nature reserves after breakfast. With our backpacks packed and the safari guide behind the wheel, we're ready for our first excursion. We're going to the Etosha National Park, one of the oldest and largest nature reserves on the African continent. The safari park encompasses more than 22,000 square kilometers. It's the habitat of 340 species of birds and 144 different mammals, including the famous Big Five, lion, buffalo, rhinoceros, leopard, and elephant. Exactly 100 years ago, the last elephant was killed here. Currently, there are large herds moving around. Different groups with a total of more than 2,000 family members now lead a protected life. Sweltering morning heat, the animals are on their way to watering holes on the edge of a salt pan of 5,000 square kilometers. The supply of water in the pan is unsuitable as drinking water because of the high salt content. That's why the animals look for their refuge in the surrounding water holes. These are fed by underground springs all year round. The muddy banks too are utilized as a beauty bath for warthogs. But satisfied after a beautiful game drive, we return to Tsumeb late in the afternoon. Just before it gets dark, the vans must be loaded onto the train. Meanwhile, the passengers gather in the train's lounge. 
The early evening will be spent discussing the program with the guide for the upcoming days. From each destination there are various excursions that can be made and it's up to the passenger to decide which van he'll be riding on the next day. Although limited, each group traveller has some choice in what he can or can't do. The wishes of the guests are taken into consideration as much as possible. On your honeymoon, then you get a romantic table in the great outdoors. It's already past midnight when a locomotive from the Namibian Railway is hitched on. The Shongololo Express is ready for departure. As the train slowly gets moving, some guests enjoy themselves in the bar. It's a good place to be for a nightcap. But most of the passengers have long since gone to bed. Tomorrow will be another early start. At half past five in the morning, we arrive in Ochiwarongo, south of Tumeb. Ochiwarongo is an important place in Namibia. It's located on the way to the Etosha Safari Park, but also on the way to a natural wonder that rises 150 meters above the plain, the spectacular Waterberg Plateau. It was here where, at the turn of the century, a violent battle took place between German colonists and the indigenous Herero inhabitants. At the foot of this plateau, the German victims found their final resting place. At one time, dinosaurs wandered here. Now, the Waterberg Plateau Park is one of Namibia's key nature reserves where countless endangered species are protected. The wild animals, adventurous hiking routes and many natural baths not only attract tourists, but especially many Namibians. The park is one of the top weekend excursions. We're back in Ochiwarongo. In this city, language and architecture are reminders of both German as well as South African domination. The German colonists arrived in 1884, but were expelled by the South Africans just after the outbreak of World War I. They obtained the mandate for the country. In 1945, the United Nations voted that the mandated regions needed to become independent. South Africa, however, refused to abide by the decision. A fierce battle for independence followed, which was led by Swapo guerrilla fighters. It took until 1990 before Namibia could finally call itself an independent republic. We return in our van to the station of Ochiwarongo to continue our journey through this young African nation. The platform has been used as a clothesline for our laundry during our absence. 
Laundry is one of the many things we needn't worry about on this trip. It's very busy at the Shongololo Express. Passengers are removing their luggage while other vans that returned earlier are being loaded onto the train. There aren't any lights at the station, so both passengers and vans must be in before dark. Daylight quickly gives way to darkness in Africa, so some haste is required. The guide talks to the passengers about the past day, while a bit further ahead, the linen room is in operation. As the last passenger hoists his luggage on board, the doors of the Shongololo Express close. Not long afterwards, nighttime falls and the train departs. We set course for the coast to the best-known bathing resort of Namibia, Swakopmund. On the train, our great speed is hardly noticeable. An old witch doctor came up with the name Shongololo for this very reason. It's the Zulu word for centipede. He said, if a centipede walks, his feet are working furiously, but his upper torso remains stationary. A fine analogy for a train that carries sleeping passengers. After a journey of nine hours, we arrive early in the morning at the station of Swakopmund. The city was founded because the Germans decided to build a port here in the beginning of their colonization. Situated between the desert on one side and a wide expanse of beach on the other, it's now become a vacation resort that's very popular with the Namibian population. On the train, the passengers gradually wake up. After breakfast, another beautiful day awaits them. <coughs> Guides and vans are ready, waiting for the daily excursions. We signed up for a tour of Swakopmund, known for its beautiful architecture. Many buildings date back to the period at the turn of the century, and 11 of them have already been declared national monuments. 
such as this former station building, currently a luxury hotel. At the beginning of the century, donkeys once pulled rail to and from the port. Now it's a sanctuary for the happy few. Svakopmund still has an unmistakably German atmosphere. We pass big villas, partly built out of wood, and a small structure that once belonged to the missionaries, the first Germans to arrive in Namibia. The simple colonial court building, too, is diligently maintained and is surrounded by one of the many public gardens in the city. This looks like a Bavarian village, our Namibian tour guide tells us, but the great architecture, palm trees and wide streets remind us of a more worldly city. Even the shopping streets have a relaxed atmosphere. After the peaceful city walking tour, we sign up for a boat trip to Walvis Bay. Cheerful dolphins accompany us. It's a wonderful experience. As we approach Valvis Bay, curious seals show up. And this is only a small number of the enormous colony that left the bank to dance and play, begging for food. <laughs> After a healthy afternoon out on the water, the passengers are back at the base. The Shongololo Express warms up for the next trip. the coast and track inland to Marienthal, an agricultural settlement. In the early morning hours, we become acquainted with the Namib, the endless vast area to which the country owes its name. Under the shimmering sun, the centipede crawls through the dry, immense plain. The Shongololo Express has only been riding here for a few years, but it's already a huge success. The old cars were rented from the Namibian Railway, renovated and remodeled into a hotel in a record eight months. Its 32 sleeping cars are simple but comfortable and decorated in the typical African style of the countryside we journey through this morning.
The small station of Marienthal is the point of departure for our vans to one of the highlights of our journey. Art directors from all over the world came before us. Countless video clips, TV commercials and advertisements were filmed against the magnificent backdrop of this park. It happens to be one of the most spectacular of Namibia, the Sossusvlei. An immeasurable landscape surrounds us. Here, where red-covered dunes reach heights of hundreds of meters, Mother Nature made her most enchanting composition with color and form. Time passes, even in a still-life landscape such as the Sossusvlei. We're once again on our way to the next highlight, Fish River Canyon. A journey of several hours takes us to a stop in the middle of nowhere. Holoch is nothing more than a road sign. Second only to the Grand Canyon in America, Fish River Canyon is the largest in the world. The steep cliffs reach depths of up to 500 meters at some spots. Together they form an impressive canyon that runs through 160 kilometers of rough wilderness. It's a spectacular example of African nature. Our journey has come to an end, and for the last time, we take our seats aboard the Shongololo Express. And while the kitchen staff are hard at work preparing our dinner, we feast our eyes one more time on the Namibian countryside. Next time, railway journeys to the south of France and the beautiful island of Corsica. Join us then.
This episode of Railway takes us into Africa. Zimbabwe is the country where we begin a 1,600-kilometer train tour with its final destination in the southern neighboring country of South Africa, the original home of our train. This is a luxurious train given the worthy name of Pride of Africa. It carries us past wilderness parks, wonders of the world, endless landscapes and colonial cities. It will be a journey through an overwhelming country on board a train that every rail enthusiast dreams of. The journey begins at the spectacular Victoria Falls, one of the seven wonders of the world. In the distance, you can catch a glimpse of a bridge, which is the railway connection between Zimbabwe and Zambia. The bridge was built at this impossible point so that train passengers could experience the sensation of the waterfalls. From the train, one looks into the unbridled depths, to the point where the Zambezi River widens to as much as 1,700 meters. The gently flowing water accumulates into immense whirlpools that then fall into the 107 meter deep ravine. Together, the various waterfalls encompass more than one and a half kilometers and create an overwhelming sight. If there is one place where the insignificance of man is felt, then it might be here. The amount of water that falls here is enormous, 545 million liters per minute in the rainy season. The power of the downpour causes part of the water to splash up again, which creates a continual mysterious mist in the area. The surrounding area benefits from this. In addition to enjoying the Victoria Falls, tourists can wander for hours through the tropical green rainforest. And anyone who looks into the horizon every now and then will discover the colorful rainbow that looks down upon the impressive waterworks. The Zambezi River is not only a major tourist attraction because of its waterfalls. Gutsy sports enthusiasts can also go rafting or bungee jumping here. Hikers can go on adventurous hiking tours, and wildlife lovers can spot wild animals along the river banks while on a river cruise. Anyone who would rather hang out for the day and has the financial means can check in at the famous Victoria Falls Hotel. Built in 1904 and completely restored and decorated in old English style some years ago, this is a wonderful place to pleasantly pass the time. The high elevation guarantees a beautiful view all around, and the luxurious accommodations and attentive staff ensure that even the most exhausted guest can unwind. And to imagine that this was once nothing more than a simple wooden structure without running water, gas, and electricity. Reluctantly, we leave behind this luxurious resort. The pride of Africa awaits us. At the beautifully maintained station of Victoria Falls, we soon discover that we will be pampered during our train journey as well. While the local passengers lug their merchandise, the foreign train passengers are greeted with a glass of champagne. A delightful foreshadowing of the luxury that Rovost Rail has in store for us. After everyone has finished his glass and has been personally escorted to his carriage, the journey can begin. The pride of Africa not only owes its fame to its extraordinary luxury, but also to the fact that the train is pulled by a steam locomotive. For this stretch of the journey, however, we'll be pulled by a diesel from the Zimbabwe Railway, since our route goes through a dry landscape which is prone to fires. For this reason, the use of a steam locomotive is prohibited here. Full of expectation, the travelers seat themselves on the train's open-air balcony and in the cozy lounge that was built in one of the 19 carriages. Most of these date back to the 20s and 30s and have been meticulously restored. 
We set course for the Huangay National Park, the largest wildlife reserve in Zimbabwe, situated south of the Victoria Falls. While the train races ahead, the sun sets and daylight gives way to the night. We're now riding through the wildlife area, but it's too dark to see the animals, who are grazing or preparing for the hunt. We'll have to wait till morning. The Huangay National Park, with its 14,000 square kilometers, is one of the largest wildlife reserves in southern Africa and one of the major tourist attractions in Zimbabwe. Set up in 1929, the area was at that time still part of the territory of the San Bushmen, who had lived and hunted here. Now only wildlife has the exclusive right to live here. In Hwange Park, over a hundred different animal species and four hundred kinds of birds have found a protected habitat. A 482 kilometer route leads to the places where the animals are most likely to stay. The intense African heat, often unpaved paths, and intense gazing for wildlife can make game drives exhausting. But the sight of the wild animals in the open nature is unforgettable and worth every hardship. The best time to see the wildlife is during the dry season, when the foliage is sparse and when animals can be seen at or near the watering holes in the daytime. During game drives, anyone who is fortunate can come across herds of over a hundred elephants, because Hwange Park is also one of the largest protected elephant habitats in the world. As in most African wildlife parks, there are sufficient accommodations in the Hwange National Park as well, varying from luxurious lodges with all the facilities to simple tents or caravans. We choose a happy medium and stay in the Linkwasha Wilderness Camp. Here we stay in traditional huts, which are plain but decorated comfortably. Anyone who stays here should not be too accustomed to pampering. Washing is done standing at the sink, and going to the toilet is done in the brisk open air. During the day, this is no problem at all, but in the dark, images are soon conjured up of hungry lions lurking about. The primitive circumstances in the camp, no electricity and running water, sometimes lead to especially creative solutions for day-to-day -day problems. Like, for example, how do you take a hot shower? Like this. Cooking is also done in a simple manner. 
Using a makeshift oven, the tastiest dishes are prepared. A perfect finish to an adventurous day in the wilderness. We trade in the sobriety of the bush for the luxury of the train and continue on our way to Bulawayo. The route Victoria Falls Bulawayo was completed in the late 19th century and was part of a railway line that was supposed to run from Cape Town to Cairo. This railway line was the initiative and vision of Cecil John Rhodes, the English settler who annexed African land with brutal force and gave Zimbabwe its colonial name, Rhodesia. The thousands of kilometers of railway track turned out to be an unattainable utopia and was never realized. But the tracks that are laid down here are heavily traveled, not only by tourists, but especially by the inhabitants who busily commute back and forth between the cities and the country. On the way to Bulawayo lies a route that was once the longest stretch of straight track in the world, 112 kilometers. The construction of the railway lines in this area was certainly not without risk. One needed to determine the route crawling through the dense brush, leaving workers as easy prey for wild animals. A strange thought for those who now look out the window. We arrive in Bulawayo, the second largest city in the country, and the headquarters of Zimbabwe Railways. Bulawayo has been called the country's best kept secret. It has only been in the last few years that tourists have found their way to this appealing city which conjures up memories of its colonial past with its old English architecture. Not that the past is so pleasant. Cecil John Rhodes obtained his mining concessions in this city from King Longangula of Nibele, only to declare war sometime afterwards and to annex the region. The native population was run off the land to make room for the Cape Town Cairo railway line. Thankfully, nothing remains from that terrible past. Instead, with its wide streets and beautifully maintained buildings, Bulawayo exerts a cosmopolitan but friendly ambience. The luxurious residences and office buildings of yesteryear now house several notable museums. Souvenir hunters have plenty of opportunity at a small market where the locals show off their productivity in the form of arts and crafts. Wicker baskets, colorful hand-painted bowls and dishes, detailed wood carvings, something for everyone here, although not everything can fit in the suitcase. But even those who aren't in the buying mood can also enjoy this market. The atmosphere is typically African, open, colorful, and friendly. While we're still deciding between the wooden giraffe and the elephant, a steam locomotive is at the station warming up. This locomotive will replace the diesel train for the next stretch of our journey. The 
the pride of Africa and its passengers are ready for departure. Still one last test of strength, and then the steam locomotive pulls away, with lots of noise and lots of steam. Part of the journey brings us across the border to Germiston, a small place near the South African capital of Johannesburg. Here our steam locomotive from the Zimbabwe Railways will be replaced by the number one locomotive of the South African Rovos Rail. On the way, we make a brief stop for minor maintenance work on the steam locomotive. While the passengers are inside enjoying a cocktail, the maintenance crew, traveling in a separate carriage, is hard at work. Water is added, used coal is removed, gauges are checked, and nuts and bolts shaken loose are tightened. And just like that, the locomotive is ready to steam again. The route Bulawayo-Germiston is the second to last stretch in our 1600 kilometer journey. We ride to the South African border and continue to travel on to Germiston. The attentive traveler sees scattered patches of black scorched brush alongside the rails. This is due to the steam from the steam locomotives, which sometimes cause small brush fires. Although the use of steam locomotives in Zimbabwe is still very common, they're being replaced more and more by diesels, partly because of this fire hazard. Evening is approaching over the last tip of Zimbabwe. In the train, the guests have changed out of their safari clothing into a dinner jacket and dress. The only occasion during this luxury train journey that requires proper attire. The dinner is served in a dining car, in a carriage that was built in 1924. It is one of the showpieces of this train, with its hand-carved woodwork and trappings in typically Victorian style. The dining car seats 44 guests, who can treat themselves to a perfectly prepared meal and excellent South African wines. This is how time passes on this long journey, while the train slips further into the dark African night. The evenings on Rovos' special train gives us an opportunity to relax and get to know the many travelers from all over the world who've come to share this lovely journey.
the morning, we let our eyes soak up the South African landscape, which we've been traveling through for the past few hours. High barriers fence off the various wildlife parks that are located in this northern province. It's already afternoon as we ride into the Germiston station. There's a flurry of activity, tourists waiting for their connections, and local residents eagerly selling fresh fruit to hungry travelers. And then the moment arrives that every steam locomotive enthusiast has waited for the link up with Rovos Rail's number one locomotive. Polished in every detail by a train-loving workforce, it shines with pride awaiting departure. It's clear where this train gets its title, Pride of Africa. This steam locomotive, with the curious name of Tiffany, was built in 1893. When the current owner bought it, it had been out of commission at a small station for a long time. In 1987, orders were given to get it riding again. After the interior was also restored, it became one of the showpieces of Rovos Rail. This locomotive is one of the four steam locomotives that pull the pride of Africa. Except for Tiffany, these were all found in the junkyard and were saved just in time from becoming scrap metal. Pride of Africa starts the last stretch of our journey. A short trip of about two hours brings us to the final destination of Pretoria. Pretoria is the administrative capital of South Africa and also the seat of President Nelson Mandela. This million plus city is moreover the point of departure for most of the train tours of Rovos Rail. From this station, the luxury trains ride to domestic locations like Kruger National Park and Cape Town, but also to places like Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, a journey of more than 6,000 kilometers clear across Africa. But we end our trip here with many memories of a unique journey. Next episode of Rail Away, we'll take the luxurious South Orient Express through the pines and gorges of famous Copper Canyon on our way through the magical country of Mexico. Railway visits Africa. This time we go to South Africa, probably the most talked about country in the continent. 
Once rejected, now embraced. Never before has the world so quickly changed its mind about a country. Since the disappearance of apartheid, South Africa is strongly advancing on all fronts. At some points pulled by an old steam locomotive, we'll travel through the country with its fabulous scenery. We'll arrive in Cape Town with the Table Mountain as its background. Hidden in clouds, we'll detect large vineyards. We'll visit the Dutch houses that have been beautifully restored. We'll travel 1,600 kilometers from Pretoria all the way down to spectacular Cape Town. Pretoria was once known as the capital of apartheid. For decades, many white governments were seated here. Not until the inauguration of President Nelson Mandela on the 10th of May, 1994, did Pretoria lose its bad reputation. One of President Mandela's predecessors was Paul Kruger. He was sworn in on the church square in the city's center. Kruger was one of the Boer leaders who stood at the cradle of present-day South Africa. His government was seated in the old council chamber. This imposing building was erected in 1883. Black children now play football in the park in front of the council chamber, where once only white children were allowed. Within walking distance from the church square stood Paul Kruger's residence. Today, the Boer leader's house is a museum. Where now broad streets are flanked by numerous monumental buildings, was once situated the settlement of Andreas and Wessel Pretorius. Both Boers founded the present city and called it Pretoria. Pretoria streets are still marked by the Boer past. Numerous monuments, streets, and graveyards were built by descendants of father and son Pretorius. The Victoria Hotel in the city center is strangely enough the departure point for our train journey. Here the passengers gather who have bought a ticket for the luxurious Rovos train through South Africa. The guests are welcomed with music that actually contrasts sharply with the rhythm of the city of Pretoria. The Victoria Hotel used to be called the Station Hotel. Here the wealthy gathered for their rail journey through the country. Passengers' baggage is brought by hand to the train. Lifting was not done in colonial days, nor are the passengers need to get tired now. On arrival at the station, the guests find champagne awaiting them. The train that is to leave in a few moments is by no means ordinary. The Rovos is the African variant of the Orient Express in Europe. Whoever buys an expensive ticket for the Rovos is really pampered. The carpet is rolled out and the hostesses take the passengers to their compartments. While another train is arriving, the pride of Rovos gets up steam. The Tiffany, a locomotive more than a hundred years old, sits shining in the station.
It's half past five in the afternoon when the Tiffany starts up, groaning and puffing, the sun low above the horizon creating beautiful shadows. We have left for the first stage of the train journey on our way to Kimberley, about 500 kilometers further on. Rovo's train also consists of a number of splendid antique carriages. Rohan Voss, proprietor of Rovo's Rail, traveled throughout South Africa in his search for old carriages. The collection he eventually hitched together is the dream of every train hobbyist. The 50-year-old observation car at the end of the train is a real gem, even in its own right. We travel through the province of Transvaal. In the 18th and 19th century, this province attracted many white farmers. They came for the fertile soil in which virtually all crops grew without problems. When darkness descends, champagne is provided for a nightcap. The carriages are basically like hotel suites. Mahogany, cherry, leather, Everything is equally luxurious in these carriages, originally built in the 1930s. Rocking pleasantly in the large bed, we find that night is quickly passed on board the Rovos. The sun appears early in the cloudless sky. The vast landscape passes uninterruptedly while breakfast is being served in the dining carriage. The menu card promises much good food, and the beautifully renovated carriage makes this journey a fantastic experience. Going southward, the landscape has become less green. In the meantime, we've entered the province of Kimberley and beginning to approach the city of the same name. Kimberley Station, the Rovos stops for a few hours to provide opportunity for the passengers to see the Diamond City. Kimberley owes its fame to the discovery of diamonds in 1869. In 10 years' time, the city changed from an agricultural village to a modern metropolis. The wealth, derived from diamonds, brought electricity to Kimberley even before New York City. This electric trolley has been operating for some time already.
We pass the old head offices of the De Beers Company in Stockdale Street. The world's most important diamond concern has been situated here for more than a century. From a relatively small office, the Englishman Cecil Rhodes started building his diamond empire. De Beers Company managed to gain and stay at the top of the diamond industry. Each year, the company directors come from New York, Hong Kong, Zurich, and Amsterdam to these offices for a director's meeting. Nearby the Beers Company is an open-air museum. Here you can see how exploration for precious stones took place in the past and in the present. Tourists are able to try it too, but they never seem to find this sort of stone. These stones look like colored gravel without value, but after treatment they're shipped all over the world. The museum also contains restored houses and shops. Near every mine, there was a little village. Originally, they were open to black and white laborers alike. But because of a fear of theft, the proprietors soon began to issue passes for the colored employees. A few black landowners also had to hand over their concessions to the white. These were the first signs of the coming apartheid. Now the quiet village seems almost charming with its painted signboards and quiet streets. In the mines of Kimberley, millions of dollars worth of diamonds were found. There are still three mines in operation where precious stones are being extracted. The biggest mine, Big Hole, has been lying abandoned since 1914. The journey to Machis Fontaine is a long one, about 700 kilometers. After a leisurely lunch, there's time for relaxation in the lounge. For the passengers, it's a good opportunity to rest. For hours in succession, we roll through the extensive landscape. The region is called Karu. It means thirsty land. birthday party on board. The person who is celebrating is able to treat his guests to a banquet, for the chef on the train can serve a splendid dinner. As the view disappears into the dark, the passengers amuse themselves in the traveling three-star restaurant. The sun has not yet appeared when we discover that the train has stopped. We are now near Machis Fontaine. Upon asking, we learn that we have to wait for another train to pass us. The colorful splendor of the rising sun makes waiting worthwhile.
The mountaintops of the Karoo are covered with red earth. Here it is always hot and hardly anything grows. The hills, the way they are situated, are the spine of South Africa. They reach from the middle of the country far into Ethiopia. After half an hour, the train we've been waiting for passes. After the antique carriages have been admired, we can continue our journey. Soon the train arrives in Machis Fontaine, a village that owes its existence to the railway. Here, travelers used to stop to recover from their journey. The trumpeter invites us to a bus tour. A double-decker bus is waiting for the passengers. A tour is an overstatement for a trip through the two streets of the village. However, the villas of Machis Fontaine make it really worthwhile. They are lovely Victorian buildings. For example, the mayor's house hidden behind the palm trees. The man is the grandson of the founder of the town, Jimmy Logan. The few buildings of Machis Fontaine have been almost all established by Logan. The Scotsman originally worked as station master in Cape Town. He soon saw that money was to be made here. Travelers between Cape Town and Johannesburg had to be able to rest somewhere, eat, and make purchases. Logan proved right, and passing travelers still come here to recuperate. Jimmy Logan made Machis Fontaine his own mini town. The shops, the bank, and the church were built by this uncrowned king of the village. The church from 1895 is no longer in use, but is still in splendid shape. Jimmy Logan himself originally came here to recover from asthma. The clean, thin air benefited his lungs, and undoubtedly he thought that others would want to profit from it. His beautiful hotel, now called the Lord Mindler, was visited by the rich from Johannesburg to Cape Town. While most of the passengers would love to spend a night in a hotel like this, it's time to head back to the train. A stone's throw from the hotel, the Rovos is preparing to go. The train is ready for the last leg of its journey. Now we're on our way down the country to our last destination, the spectacular city of Cape Town. There's about 300 kilometers to go before we shall arrive in Cape Town. They prove to be 300 beautiful kilometers. Slowly but surely, we leave the rugged mountain behind us. We ride through the Hex River Valley. This valley is famous because of the wine that is produced here. The train travels through endless vineyards. It's difficult to imagine that all winter this whole area is covered by a thick layer of snow.
train, the cooks are working on the last meal that guests will receive on this journey. It's to be a sumptuous three-course dinner with salmon and shrimp to start with. As has been the case throughout the whole journey, nothing is lacking. The marvelous food served with wine from the area we're speeding through. The Rovos is indeed no ordinary train. Just before we arrive in Cape Town, we stop briefly at the farmhouses along the railway. Built by Dutch farmers, they're called Dutch houses. Being far away in South Africa, they gave their houses an ornamental Dutch front in order to remind them of their place of birth in Holland. From the green wine fields of Blauklippen, we move to the clouds in which the symbol of Cape Town is enveloped, the Table Mountain. This colossus of sandstone towers high above the city where the Europeans of the 17th century came to anchor. For a long time now, Cape Town has not just been the old port that received seafarers to restock their ships. It is now a modern metropolis that combines old buildings from a famous past with up-to-date offices and residential areas. The city was once called the Inn of the Seas, and even now you'll find numerous hotels here, except that they become far more luxurious. Good morning. The luxury of modern Cape Town is amply demonstrated in a hotel lobby that would not look out of place in Paris. The most favored spot for tourists is the Victoria and Albert waterfront. Besides the luxurious shopping center, the beautiful harbor itself is very popular. Replicas of sea vessels that once moored here bob up and down in the water. This is the captain's building, where in the 18th century, skippers of the British fleet shared experiences with each other. While a fishing boat travels out to sea, we visit the place the seafarers look forward to for months. The Cape of Good Hope, right at the end of Africa, is also the end of this episode of Rail Away. For our next rail adventure, Rail Away visits Hungary, from stately Budapest to the hot pools at Lake Balaton. And we also follow the route of a train run by children, next in Rail Away.
I can hear the 